Dear Will, thank you for producing this insightful and informative series. I just have one question, though. My bishop is an avid hunter, yet I never see him traveling across the country with hunting hawks and falcons. As an avid hunter myself, I know that one could not possibly hunt so well without their hunting hawk and falcon. Why is it that you never see bishops traveling around with hunting hawks and falcons? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, hunters and gatherers, welcome to Clarifying Catholicism. You're watching part 13 of a series on the history of the ecumenical councils according to the Catholic Church. Today we are covering the Third Lateran Council. Much of this information was gathered from Joseph Kelly's The Ecumenical Councils of the Catholic Church, a history. So if you want an in-depth dive into these topics, make sure to pick up a copy of this book. To see the rest of our episodes, check out our playlist in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. The 12th century saw a considerable increase in the size of papal authority. The Roman Curia used their influence as an opportunity to promote a new education system called the university. At these universities, popes promoted something called canon law, a study that produced experts in both spiritual and legal matters pertaining to the church and its role in society. As the papacy's influence grew, so did the need for officials to regulate things. More bureaucracy means more complex and lengthy procedures for anything to get done. And as bureaucracy grows, so does the cost of running things. Some ill feelings from the laity resulted. Some lay people weren't exactly thrilled in seeing the church grow in wealth, especially when church officials flaunted their wealth with little results. So groups began forming that were skeptical of the church's authority. Much of their resentment would eventually culminate in the Reformation. On the imperial front, the Emperor Barbarossa wanted to bring the Holy Roman Empire into a renaissance, but he'd need a partner in crime to get this done. So he handpicked a man to be elected as Pope, but it failed. Instead, a sizable majority voted for a man who took the name Alexander III. Emperor Barbarossa was undeterred, and three weeks later he named his own choice Victor IV. Victor was excommunicated by Alexander, which is a shame because Victor was generally highly regarded, but no one except Barbarossa and his allies were willing to accept him as the true pope. After a few more failed attempts to install his own pope, the emperor gave up. In 1179, Alexander was still in power. Not only did he seek to resolve divisions caused by that schism, but he sought to refocus the church on matters it had neglected during this sidetrack. So he called a council in the Lateran Cathedral in Rome. The council opened in 1179, but there were only three sessions, all during March. Though it was short, it was well attended by 300 bishops from all over Europe. It issued 27 canons, the first of which restricted the papal election to a college of cardinals and required a two-thirds majority to choose the new pope. Any person who did not accept a pope's election was automatically excommunicated. And if they were a bishop, their ordinations were automatically invalidated. This is the procedure we have today. The council also set limits for expenditures, such as travel. As of 1179, Archbishops were no longer allowed to travel with more than 40 to 50 horses, depending on the diocese. Cardinals couldn't travel with more than 25 of them. Bishops, 20 to 30, and archdeacons, 7. No hunting hawks or falcons were allowed either in travel, which is precisely why you never see bishops traveling around with them today. Now, around this time, a lot of smaller-scale heretical movements gained traction in towns and regions across Europe. When bishops saw them as becoming too powerful and threatening to Christian society, whose laws depended on a commitment to religious orthodoxy, they appealed to Rome for advice and often sought action against these groups. The Third Lateran Council, for example, excommunicated a growing group known as the Cathars, who believed in a dualistic universe governed by two gods and that the material world was evil. There is evidence that many of them viewed procreation as evil, and they were accused of having committed abortions and infanticide. While it's difficult to gauge how accurate these claims were, the Cathars were eventually brutally exterminated, and that extermination was justified by an appeal to this council. On a similarly dark note, 
the council dealt with Jews quite harshly, declaring that the testimony of a Christian in court counts more than that of a Jew's, and whoever took a Jew's testimony over a Christian's risked excommunication. This obviously led to abuses of Jews in the court system. Well, that's it for this council. We'll see you in Lateran 4 next episode. As always, have a great day. God bless you.